Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Hadrico Live. And today we are going to the hardwood with Rebecca Greenwell. See, her official title is Sports Partnership at Facebook. But this young lady has played at Duke, McDonald's All-American, overcame adversity, eight surgeries, and guess what? She is still standing. The mindset that it takes, I'm going to give it to you because she's going to share it with us as Hadrico Live starts right now. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Hadrico Live with Hadrico Live. Hadrico Live. Hadrico, Hadrico, Hadrico Live. Hadrico Live. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Hadrico Live. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Hadrico Live. And today, Guys, my guess, she gets it down on the court. Now, we're not talking about the NBA. That's over. The playoffs are over. Congratulations to the Bucs. But we have somebody who could have helped the Bucs out, maybe even helped out the Suns with the shooting. The one, the only, Rebecca Greenwell. How are you doing this evening, ma'am? I'm good. Excited to be here. Excited to talk with you. Listen, excited to talk to you and all the things that you do and try to see if I can learn some of the skill sets to do some of the things you said. I think it was 17 three-pointers in one game. I, I haven't made 17 three-pointers in my entire life, and you've made them all in one game. Talk, I mean, how do you do these type of things? It was, it was crazy. It's hard to believe, honestly, looking back. But uh, once you get in the mindset and you're, you're feeling it, sometimes crazy things happen. Well, you know, we'll definitely get into that. But before, let's, let's go full circle. For the person who doesn't know, who is Rebecca Greenwell? Yeah, absolutely. It's a, a big question, but if I had to summarize it best, I would say Becca Greenwell is a small town kid um, from Owensboro, Kentucky. Grew up in a, a rural community, uh, farming family, uh, played basketball, played sports my whole life. Uh, went to Duke University, uh, was in was a WNBA draftee. Um, now I'm making my way in the sports business world where I work for Facebook. Um, but you know, basketball and sports in my mindset overall have opened so many doors for me. Um, it's been a fun ride so far and, you know, I'm excited to, to keep it rolling. Now you've done a lot of different things, not just on the court. Like you mentioned, you're working for Facebook and we'll definitely get into some of the, the powers that is Facebook is probably one of, it's, I think it's the biggest social media company I right now, Facebook, <laughs> Instagram. I, I don't have the stats in front of me, but I'm just going to go ahead and say it's the biggest other than Hadrico live. It don't get too much bigger than, than Facebook. So, but one thing that we like to talk about here, I love for people to learn from other people's stories, how they got over things, how they went through some hardships. Now, you said you was a draftee. You, you was, went to Duke. Now, Duke is known for basketball. We, when we'll get into that. I, I, I promise we're coming, but I want to go back a little further. In your junior year of high school, you were balling, and then you suffered a season-ending in, injury. Where did your mind go and how did your mentality help you overcome that, especially when you're a natural athlete and now they've taken away one of your loves? Yeah, that was one of the hardest moments in my life. Uh, that was the beginning of a long journey of many injuries to follow. But my first serious injury was actually my sophomore year tore my ACL um, in the summertime. So I was heading into my junior year, actually. Um, and it was devastating. It was at the moment I thought the world was ending. I thought it was the worst thing that ever could have happened to me. You know, I didn't know anything different. Um, and I, as someone, uh, one of my good family members told me, um, one of my good family friends told me you get 24 hours to sulk. And then after that, you keep it moving. And that's something that sticks with me, you know, every day, no matter what's going on. Um, but that's exactly what I did. I had 24 very rough hours. Um, after those 24 hours, I tried to shift my mindset. Um, and that's what got me through just trying to focus on the positive. You know, I couldn't control the negative. I couldn't control what was happening. Um, so I just tried to look forward. Um, and that, you know, mindset has carried me throughout my entire athletic career and business career. Um, but yeah, that, that first injury was the beginning. Uh, I've had six knee surgeries and one back surgery after that. So uh, I just have to keep trucking along. <laughs> so you you almost got a triple double in injuries, man. Come on now. We can't be having that. But you know what I love about it is that 
you know, that happened, like you said, your sophomore year going into your junior year. So you couldn't play there, but you kept your mindset 24 hours. Now, most people say, there's no way I can get over something in 24 hours. It just goes to show you how powerful the mind is when you really set it towards something. Now, I'm pretty sure even though you had your 24 hour period, there were still times and days that you kind of got down or you saw some other people hooping and you just feel like I really wanted to be out there. How did you keep yourself going in those moments? Absolutely. It was hard the entire, you know, six to nine month journey that it took me to come back. Uh, but what worked best for me was just trying to focus on the the small wins. So like, for example, that moment I could walk without my brace mm. or I could jog for the first time, you know, shooting a basket for the first time, those small wins along the way kept me going. It gave me something to look forward to. Um, and slowly but surely those small wins started to add up. So by the time I got back to the court, it was like the greatest thing that's ever happened to me in my life. Um, and that, you know, excitement and that enjoyment and my love for the game made it all worth it. Um, just being able to see all my hard work pay off. Now to say it paid off was an understatement. Now I mentioned earlier about all those threes. Now that happened to be in your senior night. I mean, excuse me, your senior year where you broke a record, 17 three-pointers in a game. What, was it frustration? Was it, oh, y'all finna get all these threes I forgot about last year? Like, what goes through your mind when you get into, everybody talks about getting in the zone. They made the movie Soul. When you get into that magical moment, where did you go? Yeah, I mean, it was a crazy feeling. I think, you know, the reason it happened is because when I was, not able to play. The only thing I could really focus and work on was form shooting and, you know, one arm shooting in front of the basket. So I eventually learned how to shoot without jumping. I could, that's all I could do. I couldn't, you know, play pickup. I couldn't get up and down. I could only shoot. Um, and once I was able to get back on the court, you know, that really paid off all the time I spent just working on my technique, working on my form. Um, and throughout my senior year, you know, I was, my three point shot was, was there and Deadly. you can tell, but that one specific game, it's just, you know, a rare moment when you get really hot and you feel like you can't miss. It was that on like steroids. <laughs> and luckily my, my coaches and my teammates supported me. Uh, they knew I was hot. They knew I was on fire. So they just kept feeding me the ball. Um, and then by the end of the game, looked up, had 17 threes, 51 points, was on, you know, Yahoo Sports the next morning. So it's a national record. I think it still stands today. Um, but it's really just, you know, all about getting in the zone. Well, I'm going to go outside and practice later. I don't know if I'm going to hit 17 of them, but I might get maybe two, three. No. <laughs> so you went on from that McDonald's All-American. You played on national teams. You had so many different accolades, even after going through some of these hardships, but then you decided to go to Duke. What made Duke stick out for you to choose to say, this is the university that I want to go to? Yeah, it was, it was two reasons. One, the athletics. When you think of Duke, you said it, you think of basketball. And that stood out to me, the basketball tradition. I, I don't know if you're a Duke fan. I don't know if anyone listening is a Duke fan. But the moment you walk into Cameron Indoor, it's just different than any other arena in the country. Like, I still get chills thinking about it. Um, so that was the probably the biggest factor, honestly, just the basketball tradition. Um, you know, they had a, a very successful women's program as well. in addition to the men, but then two was the education. Um, you know, luckily my family was really pushing that. Um, I'm glad I listened to them because you know, everything they told me is true where you go to school and, you know, the reputation that school has the education you can receive there is going to open up doors, you know, long after your playing career is over. Mm. It's not a, four year decision. It's a 40 year one. And, you know, that couldn't be more true. Um, you know, going to Duke was the best decision of my life. Um, the people I met, the relationships I made and just, you know, how, um, valuable of an education it was, um, you know, has paid, you know, dividends. dividends. For me. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, you went to Duke and you made a good, you said that how the school name carries even after their playing career. Cause most athletes, all they think about is, the next game or the, the next practice of what I'm going to do and how I'm going to get to the league, how I'm going to get to that. But there's a whole professional side. So if you were giving advice to a young athlete, male or female today, what would you tell them be some key factors to look for when choosing that 40 year de decision at that university? Yeah, I would say first and foremost, it comes down to education. Um, you know, that is 
the most important factor at the end of the day. If you have an opportunity to go to these schools where, you know, you can get a world-class education, you know, absolutely do it. Um, but then there's obviously other important factors like, you know, the quality of the team, the coaching staff, um, the players that are already on the team, all those things absolutely matter. Um, it's hard. The recruiting process is stressful. I will tell you that it's hard to find, you know, that one school that is a perfect fit. And it's not even, it's not always a perfect fit, no matter what, there's going to be ups and downs, no matter where you end up choosing. Um, but I would uh, absolutely say, you know, try to find a school where you can get the best education. Well, I think education is a key. And we, you know, we always say student athletes, but a lot of people try to forget about that student part, but it's actually a very important part. So you go to Duke, you ball out, you battle through some more injuries, but you keep going and you reach the pinnacle of women's basketball. You get drafted by the Washington Mystics. But then once again, that old that old injury bug derails your plans. Yeah. How do you handle such a roller coaster of emotion? How did you make the decision and say, hey, you know what? I have to find something else to do because my body just won't let me play basketball. Yeah, that was, you know, out of all the injuries, all the adversity, that was absolutely the hardest. Um, as I said, throughout my college, high school and college career, by the time I you know, actually got drafted, which was a dream come true just to get that far. Um, you know, by that time I had, I think, six surgeries. I had one more after that. Um, but I could just tell, you know, my body, you know, was telling me no. And I tried to ignore that for a long time. Um, right after I, the, the night I got drafted, actually, I had a surgery and the plan was to rehab, come back the next year. Um, so I rehabbed as hard as I could um, for about a year, actually. Went to D.C., worked out with the team, but still my knee, you know, wasn't right. I couldn't even jump and land without pain. Um, so eventually I had to just, you know, wake up and be like, I, I got to figure something out here. So long story short, I ended up having to have another surgery um, after that. And so you can imagine, you know, two years of not playing, being so close yet so far, it was very, very frustrating. Um, but by the time I had eight surgeries total, um, still tried to rehab and come back, but I could just tell, you know, my body was not the same and you wouldn't expect it to be the same after eight surgeries. Um, so I tried like hell, honestly, to get there. Um, but it, it was just the small things like, you know, my knee swelling up after, you know, playing a pickup game or just the aches that hit <laughs> different at that 25 versus 18. Um, so eventually I just had to be realistic. Um, but luckily along that journey of trying to get back, I had in the back of my mind, you know, trying to prepare what's, for what's next. So I did things to prepare me for that transition. I did internships. I did a, you know, I shadowed people. I networked with people. And by gaining all those small experiences along the way, that slowly made me realize that, oh, I have passions outside of sport. I can still be around the sport, um, but I don't have to deal with all the aches and pains on a daily basis. Um, so by you know, racking up, you know, new knowledge and experiences and, you know, meeting people, that made me feel okay with, you know, giving it up and moving on to that next stage of my life. You know, that is always the hardest part when we have to come to the realization that what we want the most isn't necessarily what we need for ourselves. And when you come to that, that's what I call, that's that oversized adulting. That's that real life adulting okay. decisions that you have to make. Now, let's take a look at a broader spectrum. Women's basketball all together. You know, I see the articles that say, well, LeBron James won this and he makes this amount of money. But then you have a WNBA player who's won just as many championships, puts up a lot of points, but she doesn't get that same type of financial backing or just the respect as a whole. Do you feel that women's basketball gets the respect that it deserves? If so, why? And if not, why not? I would say no. Um, I think that's an obvious decision. I mean, obvious. Uh, yeah. I mean, when you when you look at it, you can go on Instagram any moment. Like anytime there's a WNBA post, there's always haters in the comments. It's like ridiculous. No matter what, even if like Diana Taurasi dropped 50, there's always going to be haters in the comments. So no, I definitely don't think they get the respect they deserve. They absolutely should. You know, they work just as hard as the men, you know, they're at practice every day for four hours. They're putting in the work, they're grinding. 
So yes, they absolutely should get the respect. I will say, I think it's improving. Um, It's absolutely improving. And I think a big reason for that is because of media coverage. WNBA has done a great job, has really improved with their marketing as of lately. And then there's also all these new, you know, media companies, digital publishers coming out that are, you know, amplifying women's sports. Um, So I think the more media coverage there is out there, the better, you know, respect Mm -hmm. these women are going to get. But I still think there's a long way to go. Um, But that's just a part of it. You know, I I agree with you. There is a long way to go, but I do say the steps have been going better and better. And you're starting to see more female athletes, more WNBA players. They're starting to become more of household names. Speaking Mm -hmm. of household names, who are some of the WNBA players that you looked up to or female basketball players that you looked up to? Are you wanted to kind of guide your career around when you were coming up? Yeah. So one in particular, she was not my position, but Candace Parker. Um, I was a huge Tennessee basketball fan growing up. Um, I'm from Kentucky, so Tennessee was pretty close to me. I went to Tennessee camps every single summer as a little girl and, you know, was always there. Candace was always there. I would always meet her. And I just loved the way that she treated everyone. Um, She was an amazing basketball player, still is an amazing basketball player. The more so, you know, how she interacted with fans off the court is what stood out to me. Um, and I still remember, you know, the small interaction interactions with her when I was like, you know, 10, 11 years old. Um, so I'd say that is one player, um, for sure. Definitely. We almost done. Look, this is rolling good. Look, you killing it, girl. You killing it. Okay. So look, you know what? Even though you hung up the Jersey, you are now the starting guard for Facebook sports relationships. How has that transition from the athletic world to the corporate world been? I mean, do you still find yourself boxing people out at the printer trying to get, you know what I'm saying, get your copies? Do you feel like, are you at your desk, balling papers up, still working on that jump shot? Talk to me. How has that transition been? Yeah, I would say, you know, a lot of the competitiveness for my athletic career um, and, you know, the way I approach things has definitely translated. I will say it, it takes a while, you know, for any athlete out there who is, you know, making the transition to the business world, it's not going to be easy at first. I've now been, you know, in the business working world for about three years now. Um, And, you know, at the beginning, it's tough. Like no one wants to, no former athlete wants to be sitting at a desk all day. Like it's hard to make that move. Um, But you just have to apply the same mindset. And if you do, and most importantly, if you find something that you're passionate about and you love, you know, it's the same approach to sports, you know, you know, if you put in the work, you know, it's going to pay off. Mm -hmm. And now I'm starting to see that in my business career. Um, And I just think that is what makes, you know, sports so powerful, all the small, you know, things it teaches you that you, you can't get anywhere else. Um, But so far, yeah, I've only been at Facebook for a few months. Um, That's how I met you through it um, at Stanford. But it's been an incredible experience, you know, working for one of, working for the, you know, largest social media platform um, and being able to work on the sports partnership team um, is a pretty fun job. Now, we always like to educate too. explain the sports partnership team. What all does that position encompass? Like, what do you do as a sports partnership? Yeah. uh, So we have a pretty big team overall in the sports partnerships. Um, I specifically work on the team side. So I manage relationships with professional teams as well as college teams and essentially help them be successful on Facebook and Instagram. Um, So on the pro team side, you know, we're basically free consultants to, you know, pro teams, NBA, NFL, all pro teams. Um, And we teach them how to use Facebook to create great content, to build fans, um, to sell, you know, tickets through their advertising platform, to drive sponsorship and to, you know, basically build their businesses. And then on the college side, we work with programs and athletes um, to help them be successful on Facebook. And that's more relevant than ever with NIL. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. So that's where that's why I met you speaking at Stanford to their athletes talking about NIL and how student athletes can leverage that on social media. Um, so that's a whole nother, you know, world that's still brand new and evolving every day. Um, but something I'm, you know, obviously passionate about being a former student athlete. Now, if you, you get into NILs, we, I mean, we have to do it. By the way, I want all that same training for Hadrico Live so we can be get right. So we, we, we'll talk about that later. We'll talk about that later. But with the NILs, 
What can these athletes do? Just some small things that you say that can either help them in their social media biz, biz, presence, excuse me, or better yet, if you had to give a tips of five, top five tips of how to build your profile, especially in this NIL area, what would you advise these athletes? Yeah, I would say the first step is just, you know, getting your profile prepared. Um, so some tips, quick tips you could do is one with your username, make sure your name is in your username somewhere. It can be, you know, simple, your first and last name. It can just be your last name. But the reason being is because when a fan wants to search you and find you or a brand wants to search you and find you, you need to be easily searchable. Um, so that's one simple way. Okay. Uh, the second thing is your bio. So make sure when someone comes to your profile, they can quickly see what you're all about. So me, you know, if you look at my Instagram name now, um, it'll say, you know, uh, former Duke women's basketball player, Facebook sports partnerships, Kentucky native with a emoji, you know, that represents all three of those. So for any athlete out there, college athlete, you know, if you're uh, Louis from your Louisville basketball player, you know, have a, Emoji of a Cardinal with Louisville women's basketball. Um, and then three just quick bullet points that, that that represent you, you know, tell people mm -hmm. what you're all about. Um, so those are two simple ways. Um, but most importantly, I would just say post consistently. You know, if you can post every day, that's amazing. Not everyone can do that. But at a bare minimum, if you're looking to build up a brand at least a couple times a week. Um, and then... The format, I think, you know, is easiest for anyone to uh, take advantage of is Instagram stories. Mm -hmm. The reason being is because that's where you can go to post casual updates. You know, there's not a, it's kind of a low risk, high reward. Unscripted. Activity. Unscripted. Yeah. And that's where people can really, you know, go and, and get a vibe for you, you know, get to know you on a deeper level. Um, what else? I guess I need one more. Um one more I would say behind Instagram stories would be IG live. Um, the reason being is because, you know, that's where you can be the most raw, the most direct. Um, and also, you know, your followers get a notification and whoever you're going live with gets a notification. So mm -hmm. it's an opportunity to reach new audiences. Um, so those are a few, you know, quick ways that um, anyone can look to build their brand. Now, see, you don't only have expertise in the NIL world. You also have expertise in adversity. So how, you know, we, people love lists. That's why I do all these top fives because people love lists. If you get somebody a list, they'd be like, let me just follow the list and I can do it. So in, in your opinion, top five, or just give me some tips that you would say the best ways to overcome adversity for an athlete. Yeah. Uh, first, I would say have a positive attitude. You know, no matter what you're going through, um, don't sulk on it. You know, don't, you know, let it get you down. Try to stay positive no matter what. The more you can focus on the good, you know, the better you're going to feel, the better results you're going to get out of it. So, number one, positive attitude. Um, two, just hard work. You know, it's it's going to be a grind. It's not going to be easy. Um, but, you know, nothing, you know, ever worth having comes easy. So, you know, be willing to put in the work. Three, actually, this one probably should have been number one, but just be humble. Mm. You know, I think humility is something that's you know super rare these days. Um, but I think, you know, being humble can take you so far. You know, even, you know, when you're at your lowest low and when you're at your highest high, you know, humility um, can go a long way and really open up a lot of doors for you. Um those are, let's do top three. Cause I there think you go. I, I'll take three. three Cause you, you know what? That leads me to what I like to call the final time out for the final time out. Ladies and gentlemen, what she told us today was some very important things. Number one, when you're going through that adversity time, finding those small victories, being able to walk, being able to jog, being able to shoot. So many times we take so many things for granted. We just take it as, Oh, it's supposed to happen that way. We ain't nothing in life guaranteed, but life and death. So you got to take advantage of each and every last one of those moments. Number two, if you're trying to go through something, being humble, positive attitude, and hard work, I mean, that formula can be used everywhere, but these are the ways you're going to get to where you're trying to get to after going through those hard times. I believe Dwayne Wade said it, Monty Williams said it, everything you want in life is on the other side of hard. You just got to be able to go through it. we like to thank our guests. Miss Greenwood, where can the people find you? What else you got going on? I know you got a basketball camp. I've seen some. Yo, talk, 
talk to me, man. How can the people link up with you? Yeah, you can find me on Instagram and Facebook, of course. Uh, Instagram, my handle is bgreenwell23. Notice got my name in there, so you can easily find me. Um, also, feel free to add me on LinkedIn. Uh, I think I'm under Rebecca Greenwell, actually, on LinkedIn. Um, but I respond to every DM, every message, um, because you know, I think that's important to help people get to where they're going. So feel free to shoot me a note. I'm happy to to talk with anyone. Well, we'd like to thank you for your time. And ladies and gentlemen, that is another episode of Hadrico Live in the books.